Welcome into the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. It is a Wednesday. That means only one thing. It's news time, kids. And uh, we're also, I, I think we still have a Parashare story to do today. Remind me to get to it today. I forgot last week because my memory is frail. I still have a little bit of COVID brain. So I, I've got to I got to get over that deal. Uh, in order to do this, I need a co-hostess. So I went out and got the best in the biz. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is, Mally Fox. Mally, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Splendid, my dear. Splendid. Uh, You know, what? I shouldn't say splendid. We have a lot going on in this nation, by gosh. Not only are we losing people left and right as far as celebrities go, but uh, Hurricane Helene is a bitch. Let's just put that right up front. Um, We are saying a lot of prayers, hoping that a lot of families are safe out there. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know there are quite a few that aren't, and we do want to send out um, our utmost uh, thoughts and prayers to those people who have lost family members uh, over Mm -hmm. the weekend, over the last week, uh, to this hellacious storm that's been uh, going on in the southeast and south. Uh, Again, we say prayers to you for strength and comfort during this trying time. Uh, People in Florida, Georgia, um, North Carolina... Uh, and now, evidently, going up to Vir- Tennessee. Tennessee now going up to Virginia, <laughs> evidently. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and going further east, further up into the east. So, for all of you, again, our our heartfelt sympathies and mm-hmm. um, folks everywhere else, we encourage you to get a hold of organizations that are going down there, physically going mm-hmm. down there to help. Um, dig into your pockets or get on your phones and donate. Uh, you don't have to get down there yourself to help because Lord knows there's going to be plenty of people getting down there to help. But get uh, get on your phones or, or get a few bucks out to someone who is going down there to help and help rebuild. There's some devastated areas down there. man. Oh, yeah. yeah. My problems are so minute to what's going on with those guys. Yeah. Just losing houses trapped yeah yeah no water uh uh, i was watching uh one of the news organizations last night i mean just between the stuff going on in Asheville, north carolina Mm -hmm. and the stuff going on in the appalachian mountains to Mm -hmm. i mean there's one story of one woman um last night one of the news stations i was watching who's up in the appalachians who's i think half an hour from any contact with anyone they can't get to her she mm-hmm. doesn't have any food, any water, any medicine. Mm-hmm. And they don't know because all contact's been cut off with her, whether she's alive or dead. Mm-hmm. And it's such a incredibly tragic story. Mm-hmm. You know, um, to think that we have all this technology at our hands, yet we can't, we still can't put modern communication means in rural areas. Um, Mm -hmm. we could, but do we, do we spend the money? You know, infrastructure bills are one thing. We could talk politics all day long if we wanted to, Mm -hmm. but, um, but to get stuff like fiber in, in rural areas is stuff that we need to do so that we have communication in rural areas in times like this buried fiber so that rural areas can make phone calls that they can send texts that they can, Mm -hmm. you know, so we have instant communication to, um, in, in, in severe weather emergencies and times like this. So we, we can get people out quickly. Well, also like in the mountains, there's one road that goes in and one road that goes out. You know what I mean? There's no alternative routes that they can take. Right. Well, and, and, you know, airlifting and things like that is expensive, but you mm-hmm. got to do it. I mean, you just, yeah. there's, there's things you have to do in times like that. You know, there's, there's things that you have to, ways you have to look at alternative ways you have to look at in order to get people saved in order to get people, mm-hmm. you know, and, and things like burying fiber and, and getting communication up there quicker, you know, mm-hmm. um, getting notices to people quicker so that they can get out or you can get notice to people who can get up there to get them out. Um, 
you know, sometimes communication is, is the key mm-hmm. uh, to helping people in rural areas. Um, communication sometimes is so slow and it, it stops us from getting people safe quicker. And, and it's, mm-hmm. I can't stress it enough. When you, when you talk to uh, meteorologists, when you talk to um, people who work in, um, well, you know, I mean, you know, with your husband, he'll tell you that as well. Um, when it comes to saving someone's life, communication mm-hmm. is key. Oh, yes. And I, I just think that if we had the, that's just the, the, one, the first step is getting mm-hmm. fiber into all rural areas so that they have as high speed, if not a uh, higher speed than what we have in, in the city and urban areas. Mm-hmm. And then to be able to figure out a way to get out the elderly and infirm. Yes. In times like this and to do it safely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can minimize and there shouldn't be a reason why in 2024 we can't get the elderly and infirm out mm-hmm. in, in situations like this. But I'll get off my soapbox. It just it's times like this I get frustrated. So Right, right. No, I understand. This is what my mind has been focused on for the past few days where I feel like with people celebrating. I mean, everyone has a right to do what they want to do. But when I know all this stuff is going on and like I told you, my family's from Kentucky and Tennessee. We're mountain people. Mm-hmm. And so like I was just at my reunion a week ago, I had no reception stuff because I'm in the mountains, you know, rural area. But it's like I'm so focused on that. It's hard to be, you know, talking about things that really aren't important when you compare to what's going on sure. in our country. Sure. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's it's like a little war. I'm having a struggle. Yeah. And it's, it is a dire time, folks, as we're recording this right now. Iran is launching bombs at, at Israel. Yes. Jesus, I, I mean, you know, I mean, we may be on the verge. Of, I'm not, this isn't hyperbole. We may be on the verge of World War Three. Yeah. So, and then we've got the, what, the strikes going on at the ports. Yep. You know, just all of these things striking at Marathon, striking at, I mean, just, ugh, just stuff going on in this world that I'm not. I just want to hibernate. <laughs> and then, then we find out the father of the Evans family died on August 21st. With everyone dying too. Yeah, there's been too many deaths. Too many deaths. Ugh. Yeah. I and, used to be a religious watcher of the soap opera Days of Our Lives, and then I found out John Black died, and I was yep. like, "What?" I mean, I haven't watched it since college, but I was like, "I had the hots for him." <laughs> oh, he's so gorgeous in the '90s. Dang. Yep. Yep. So it, it it's been a weird and disastrous weekend. That's the best way to put it. <laughs> Although one thing that wasn't disastrous, if I may, uh-huh. if I may congratulate my nephew Tyler, his wife uh, Maya. Yes, congratulations! They threw a hell of a party this weekend. Mm-hmm. Probably one of the best. And I'm I'm not being I'm not being impartial here or partial. Yeah, I'm not being partial. I'm being impartial. Uh-huh. Uh huh. One of the best parties I've ever been to, as far as a wedding goes. Nice. Yeah, they threw a hell of a party. It was it was a lot of fun. In fact, I still have my little party maker from it. It was, it was like a thing that lit up different colors uh-huh. and, and strobe. And yeah, if I were up a lot. You bring that out on the dance floor? Uh, I, I couldn't get out there because of the shark go foot. But I, I, did a, I did a chair dance that would kill most people. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> um, but yeah, we just, a uh, lot of family there. Lot, oh my gosh, the food was so good too. Mm-hmm. Oh, let me tell you, Mally. Oh my Where was God. it at? Uh, they had it, um, they had it out in Northfield, Minnesota. I'm trying to remember okay. the name of the, the place, but it was outdoors. Nice. Um, and it, it's a, it's a place that is set up for outdoor weddings and they have different pavilions. They have four different pavilions and then mm-hmm. they have a tented, um, like reception area. Uh, uh-huh. and it's set up specifically for reception and DJ wedding, uh, uh, dance area and stuff like uh-huh. that. Oh my gosh. It's gorgeous. Mel. They have, you know, they have like the, uh, an outdoor fire pit for you too, like a little outdoor fireplace. And they have uh-huh. the little, what are the little, uh, like flame pillars and things like that? Little s- sit down fire okay. patio area. Um, 
it's just perfect. They have a little outdoor bar area too. And nice. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's like a multi million dollar outdoor wedding complex. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's just amazing. It was just so perfect. There was it was perfect. That's the only way to describe Aww. it. It was just completely perfect. It was a perfect day. So uh so yeah, Tyler Maya, your your uncle Timmy is just so God damn proud of you. That's that's the only way to put it. So yeah, I just I had such yeah. a great time this weekend. So not only that, but the Vikings beat the goddamn Packers. You gotta love it. It was <laughs> I mean okay, we're done with that. Um but <laughs> yeah, it was but that Well, part, but aren't the twins now out of the baseball? Yeah, way to rain on my parade. Thing. <clears throat> well yeah. I think we're doing pretty good still. The Tigers. Yeah, yeah, your tigers are doing well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finally! Well, we, we know it's Viking season when the twins are out. So, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Twins haven't twins haven't won a World Series since '91, so we're not worried about. Yeah. It. yeah. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was Back ma- in the day, I was making I was making Homer hankies in college '91. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I worked at the factory, you know. Yeah, yeah, because I, yeah, I was a freshman in college. Yeah. Can't Fun. tell you what. Oh, you were at the factory that made the hankies. Yeah, well, I, I thought made, you were talking about like you just made homemade ones. No, I like got out the puffer paint. <laughs> I made them as in uh, on a press. Like you did the pressing. Yeah, I pressed. Wow. I pressed Homer hankies at Wincraft. Okay. Yeah. So those those Homer hankies you were waving at the dome. Yeah. I was, I was on a press sixty hours a week and trying to go to school at the same time. <laughs> so could have had your DNA on there from like yes. sweating. <laughs> yeah, you've got my DNA in a Homer hanky. That didn't sound right, I know, but yeah. so there you go. Oh, little known things about me. There you go. <laughs> oh, I suppose we should probably get to the show. Big, big yeah. show today, uh, Mal. It's uh, and and the sad thing, there's only since '91. I think they've only come out with another three or four versions of the Homer hanky since then. Uh huh. Yeah. So. But my DNA is not in any of those, so you got to find a 91 <laughs> in order to get my DNA in a hanky. I think, wait, that didn't sound right, um, to get my DNA in a hanky. Um, I have a 91 around here somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. I think I threw mine away like the day after. Oh, <laughs> really? I'm not nostalgic. I hmm. wish I would. Well, I am with certain things, but sports, sorry, I'm not. no. I I'm a disappointment to my to the guys in my family, but <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. I'm just not one. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've got a hundred thousand sports things around the house. I probably mm-hmm. should clean it up. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. Have me a have me a garage sale. There you go. Yeah, I might make some money. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of making some money, by gosh, we uh we have a big show here today. We could make some money off this deal. I tell you, if we could sell some ads. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, people are like, aren't there too many ads already? Um, here's the uh, deal for today's show. We have we have a lot of alien and AI stories today. Okay. We got to, great. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I chose the perfect episode to be on. Mally's like the AI. Mally's like my favorite. <laughs> yeah. As, I would like to sleep tonight, but alas, I as, probably won't. <laughs> as if the, this week hasn't been good enough to you this week. Stressful Mal. enough. Yeah. Uh, we also have some interesting stories on the back end of this show as well. We have we had a, another Loch Ness sighting, so we'll, we'll oh, talk about okay. that. And we do, I believe, have a parashare story. We're gonna we're gonna try and get to that as well. Uh, before the end of the show let's kick it off because we got a lot to get to shall we an alleged exotic ufo material laboratory test result has been published the material had undergone undergone testing at the oak ridge national laboratory to find out if it was genuinely alien in origin back in 2019 steve justice chief operating officer of the to the stars academy of arts and sciences revealed that the organization had been working to independently prove the exotic properties and attributes of UFO meta or meta materials, not meta materials, but meta materials that it had somehow gained possession of at the time. It was suggested without evidence that the materials had the capacity to function as a terahertz waveguide, thus enabling it to generate anti-gravity capabilities TTSA has acquired multi pieces or multiple pieces 
of matam, or metamaterials that are reported to have come from an advanced aerospace vehicle of unknown origin, the group wrote. We're enthusiastic about its potential use and how it can further our mission for discovery and innovation. Later in an interview with the New York Times, Luis Elizondo, the Academy's Director of Global Security and Social Programs, confirmed that they were in possession of exotic material samples from UFOs and that efforts were ongoing to find the most qualified individuals at the most respectable institutions to conduct scientific analysis. Five years on, and we finally have the results of this analysis, which was carried out by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I hear there's Oak Ridge boys there, Mally. I'm just I just started singing that song in my head when you said Oak Ridge. Giddy up, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> uh, at the request of the uh, Aero Office or All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which sings that song all day long, just saying. Uh, those expecting this particular material to be a smoking gun with regard to alien evidence, however, may be a little disappointed with the findings. Uh oh, here we go. Uh, O-R-N-L assessed the specimen to be terrestrial in origin and that it does not meet the theoretical requirements to function as a terahertz waveguide, according to the lab. The material is, in fact, an alloy containing magnesium, zin zinc, and bismuth. But doesn't most stuff from space? I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. The specimen's physical properties are consistent with a material of terrestrial origin, according to the report. Considering all available evidence, Arrow assesses that the specimen likely is a test subject, a manufacturing product or byproduct or material component of aerospace performance studies to evaluate the properties of magnesium alloys. In other words, fancy speak for eh, it's just a piece of earth metal. So five years to be let down. Yeah, yeah, that's most relationships in general yeah, right now. I'm it's just true. Saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The climax. Nah, nah. Yeah, it's a one of those. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dang, that yeah, sucks. That does. Our second story has to do with an alleged UFO whistleblower offering bizarre alien invasion predictions or a prediction. We'll put it that okay. way. Okay. A man who says that he has extensive insider knowledge has been making some rather questionable claims. According to reports, Charles McNeil, allegedly a U.S. Air Force intelligence insider, has put forward the bizarre claim that he was once recruited to join a top secret unit tasked with maintaining a 70 year truce between the government of the United States and some sort of alien civilization. He also maintains that this truce is supposedly about to come to an end, leading to what he describes as a series of dramatic events. These will allegedly include some sort of global conflict as well as a staged alien invasion that will make use of reverse engineered UFO technology. It doesn't stop there either, as McNeil also claims that an effort to slowly expose humanity to the reality of extraterrestrial visitation has been playing out for decades in the form of movies, books, and television shows about alien invasions and various other science fiction scenarios. This is known as the Public Acclamation Program, or PAP, he says. You know what else it is, Mally? Huh? It's a PAP smear. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> I did. I was like, now nah, he won't. Oh, he did. I did. <laughs> Uh, for decades, you have been force-fed, fictionalized versions of the truth via TV, movies, and books, McNeil goes on to say. McNeil has even offered a description of the various alien races that he claims will be invading us. Type A through C have a grayish or grayish pigmentation, or gray or grayish pigmentation that can come off as a bit chalky sometimes, he said. They have four fingers with little suction cups on the ends of each finger, and some have webbing in between their fingers and toes. Type D have a brownish pigmentation and five fingers and five toes. The species started off fully biological until they ventured out into the cosmos and came into contact with what they now answer to, something called the Keeper. They now worship technology and started to incorporate mechanics into their biological makeup thousands of years ago. Suffice to say, it would probably be best to take those claims with a very large pinch of salt indeed, is what the story wraps up with. 
Mm. Yeah. Do you believe in the 70 year truce? Oh, I don't know if I do or not. I, it's hard for me to believe any of this stuff now because I know, I know. Once they, as well. once they tell us, well, you know, maybe there's life out there. Maybe there's a little bit of life out there. I, we read stories from week to week where, you know, there might be life out there, but it might only be on one or two planets. And then it's, well, there's got to be some life out there. Then there's the Fermi paradox. And then there's, and now it's all going to be, a, according to this, this story, it's all going to be a, a fake, I don't know. Yeah. I've, I've been watching pro yeah. wrestling for too long. I, I, I think everything's oh, a work. Speaking of wrestling, have you watched that McMahon thing on Netflix? I am four episodes into six. So I am one episode in. I love it. I think it's great. You know, and here's the thing with it. You Once you get deeper in, you're going to love it, Mally. You're going to love the series. Uh-huh. Because yeah, I already like the first episode. You'll, oh, you, it, it gets better. It gets much better. Uh-huh. Um, but a lot of it, now, if you're not familiar with the ins and outs of the history of WWE, you're really going to love it because there's a lot of things in there that you'd never heard before. Uh-huh. But for fans who have, longtime fans who know the ins and outs and the dirt of WWE, there's not a lot in here that's new, okay? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of recap with the occasional sprinkle of new stuff that comes up, um, especially through episode four. Mm-hmm. It's the really juicy new stuff that comes up in five and six, I hear. Okay. Yeah, and especially with the lawsuits and stuff like that, uh, and the new lawsuit with uh, Janelle Grant, uh, the uh-huh. the woman that uh, both he and John Laurinaitis are accused of uh, sexually assaulting and trafficking. Mm-hmm. Now, the newest news, you know, I love the message boards that that talk about well, you know, it's just, it's a civil suit. McMahon hasn't been charged with anything. What the newest news is about Vince McMahon is that the feds have his cell phones. Uh-huh. And Janelle Grant's lawyers are now taking anybody who wants to come through and testify about Vince McMahon and anything he's done in the past. They're now referring these character witnesses and any other witnesses to McMahon's activities they're taking these witnesses and referring them to the feds. They don't oh. even want them on the civil suit. Okay. They want them on McMahon's criminal trial. Oh. Which is huge. Yeah. So all the all the <clears throat> WWE marks are saying, oh, McMahon doesn't have any criminal charges. Stay tuned. He's about to be Diddy. Right. <laughs> you know? Oh. Yeah. There were some old photos that they were showing of McMahon, like when he first started out. So he's probably like, what, in his 20s? And I swear to God, some of the angles and the facial expressions was Zach Baggins when he yes. first started out. Yep. I was like, they look so much alike. They do, don't they? Uh, <laughs> yeah. When when McMahon was young, he had a very mm-hmm. long, angular body. And, and I mean, he had the chest. He had the barrel right. chest, right? Yeah. But his arms are really long. His legs are really long. And he does mm-hmm. have that Zach Baggins face. Yeah, it was the face. I'm like, holy shoot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they look alike. Now, if anyway. you only had a Datsun 280Z and eight Doritos, I would have swore I went alien hunting with them. <laughs> Just saying. I don't know. <sighs> Just saying. Just saying. <clears throat> we love you, Zach, Sorry. by the way. Miss we you. Di- yes, we yeah. do love Zach, yeah. but we digress. We digress. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you put young Vince and young Zach in a room together, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Wouldn't be able to do it. But you'd have to time travel and mix everything up and go all timey. Right. And yeah. We don't have yeah. time to do all that. Uh, speaking of things you won't be able to tell apart from anything else, NASA has their rover up there on Mars now. Uh-huh. And they've now claimed they've discovered a strange zebra rock on the surface. And zebra rock is not a program that ABC had out there in the 80s. It's okay. an actual rock. I'll show you a picture of it. It's... They're calling this a zebra rock. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The peculiar striped rock is quite unlike anything that scientists have ever seen before on the Red Planet. In fact, NASA's Perseverance rover, which landed on the surface of Mars back in 2021, has certainly seen its fair share of unusual things since it began its adventures in Jezero Crater. This latest example, which was spotted as the rover was driving over pebble-strewn ground, has been nicknamed Freya Castle 
and is believed to measure around 20 centimeters in length. Particularly odd is the fact that the rock seems to have zebra-like stripes, making it quite unlike any of the other rocks found in this particular region of the planet's surface. Since Freya Castle is a loose stone that is clearly different from the underlying bedrock, it has likely arrived here from some place else, NASA wrote. The stripes are thought to have formed through indigenous or metamorphic processes. It is hoped that if Perseverance can find more rocks of this type over the coming weeks and months, it might help shed new light on what they are and how they formed and where they come from. So hmm. there you go, zebra rock on, uh, on Mars. Or as Vince McMahon would say, Zebra Rock coming to the WWE. <laughs> <laughs> it's as good as it gets with a McMahon impression. <laughs> so, there you go. All right. We talked about doom and gloom earlier. I got uh-huh. uh, I got a bit of doom and gloom news for you, although it could be promising. Okay. Okay. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, the nuclear blast and the asteroid. Yes. Okay. According to this new study, a nuclear blast could be used to redirect a killer asteroid. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of an update from last week. It is perhaps ironic that Earth's deadliest weapon of mass destruction could potentially save us all from catastrophe. Now, when it comes to using nuclear bombs to deal with an approaching apocalyptic asteroid, most people would likely think of the Bruce Willis movie Armageddon, in which oil rig workers drill a hole into an asteroid and then detonate a nuke inside of it to prevent it from striking the Earth. In reality, doing this or even just firing a nuke at an asteroid's surface is highly unlikely to work because it would create an enormous debris cloud that would rain even more devastation upon us. Never thought about that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't claim to be a physics major, just saying. (laughs) This doesn't mean that nuclear weapons couldn't be used to solve the problem, however. In a recent experiment, physicists at Sandia National Laboratories tested to see if it was possible to direct the megapulse of radiation from a nuclear explosion at an incoming asteroid. They determined that if this could be done just right, part of the surface of space rock would effectively be vaporized by the extreme heat nudging the asteroid off course. Whether this could be actually achieved in practice on a real asteroid, however, remains to be seen. I don't know that I want to be there for that testing. No, let's wait until we're we're dust. <laughs> yeah. Or an asteroid to come towards towards yeah. Earth. <laughs> I, I can wait a few generations to try that. Yeah. Uh, asteroid impacts are among the many natural hazards facing civilization, the scientists wrote. Although most asteroids bypass the Earth or cause little damage, the largest collisions have led to regional devastation and even the elimination of habitable climates. Although rare, the elimination of devastating impacts has become a national priority. See, this is the other thing that makes me nervous is, you know, we're planning all these trips to different destinations. There's a story out there. I'm trying to remember if I have it here. But there is a, um, a story this week that there's plenty of water on the moon. Okay. Oh. So, again, we're mm-hmm. talking about terraforming the moon. We're, right. We're talking about Mars. I have a story here about living on Mars that, that it's going to alarm you a little bit. Right. Um, we could all become the Hulk on Mars. I'll tell you about it in a second. Um, there, there's all these stories about other planets and we're all being pushed to other planets. Well, why? What do we know that, that all of a sudden we're being pushed to other planets? Something's out there that we're not being told about. You know, that, that's going to threaten mm-hmm. us here relatively soon. I'm a little nervous about that, Mel. I mean, we're... Great. Now we're, I have that in my head, too. Sorry, Melly. I didn't mean to do that to you today. <laughs> Here's the story that is a little uh, alarming. I'm going to give you the heads up here. How would you look looking like that? Are you, are you, do you look good in green? <laughs> I wonder if that came off easily. It doesn't. That's not if you're on Mars. <laughs> Here's the story, Mally. Humans living on Mars could potentially turn green. So if you're thinking of moving to Mars, you'd become the She-Hulk. But how long does it take to get to Mars? Five years. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, is it five years? I'm trying to know. I don't know. No, I don't think it takes five years anymore. I think they have a faster rocket. 
Mm. It used to be it would take you five years, but I don't think it takes five years anymore. Let's let's find out here. Uh, creating a colony on Mars would not only be technologically challenging, but also <laughs> biologically taxing as well. For some time now, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has been talking about sending shiploads of over 100 passengers at a time to Mars in an effort to found a thriving colony there. But it seems that he has given little thought to just how difficult it would be to actually survive on the surface of another world. Even if we ignore the technological hurdles of building a sustainable base on the red planet, living permanently on Mars is likely to have a considerable negative impact on the human body. Now, according to biologist Dr. Scott Solomon of Rice University in Texas, any babies born on Mars are likely to experience a significant mutation and evolutionary change due to a combination of exposure to radiation and the planet's lower gravity. Such changes could range from poor eyesight, weak muscles, and brittle bones to the possibility of the skin literally turning green. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about Hulk babies? <laughs> <laughs> as long as they don't have the anger issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would, yeah. Such conditions are also likely to increase the risk of various cancers and other illnesses. Okay, then why go? Yeah, exactly. Why are we doing that then? <laughs> this has to be one. Is it like those commercials for medicine where it's like, can cause this, this, and this, and it's like, okay, well, then why take it? <laughs> right. Right. The The one that still gets me, and, and I'm on one of these drugs, is the whole, uh, the whole, um, Infection of the taint deal. Okay. Have, have you heard of this? Uh-uh. Mm. Okay. So um, it goes through all the side effects and, you know, it could cause, uh, uh, it's uh, something like cancer of the thyroid and blah, 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 blah. And by the way, you could get an infection that right of your, it doesn't say on your taint, but it says right. uh, the, what do they call that between the, um, you know, the thing in the, in the asshole? It's the, it's the, what's the, the medical name? It isn't the taint. It's the... Um, I don't know. God damn, I don't remember what it is. But the minute they said it... I refer to that area as the hoo-ha, so you don't want to ask me. Well, no, your hoo-ha isn't your taint. Your hoo-ha is your No, hoo-ha. I know that, but I'm saying medical terms, I use hoo-ha. So it's like, I am not the person to ask what okay. that section is between the whatever okay. and the whatever. Yeah. <laughs> is it? It's not parabellum. What is it? It's... um. I don't remember. But anyways, uh, somebody with a medical background is going to email me. I right. know they will. But, um, and I probably just named it. It's probably the Parabellum. Um, but uh, but the minute I heard it on TV, I went, no. And they're like, <laughs> because if you get some redness or itching there, it could result in an infection. And you're like, no, my taint's going to fall off? <laughs> you could be taintless. You could be taintless. <laughs> well, taintless in Seattle, right? But then- yeah. But then you're like, wait a minute, what happens if you don't have a taint? Mm. You got a big gaping area. Right. But then if the infection spreads, which way does it go? Does it take your bunghole or does it take your her? And if it takes your her, I mean, what do you do? Huh? I mean, this is some serious shit. Right. Why do I even take the drug at all then? (laughs) (laughs) Why would you take that risk? Right. But then my doctor's like, it's really good for your heart. And you're like, oh, I just went through some heart shit. Maybe I could. But take, I could be taintless. <laughs> I could be taintless in Minneapolis. <laughs> but at the same time, it's really good for the heart and the liver and the kidneys and the brain. Let's go for it. Hey, let's roll the dice. But if that stuff's falling out because you have a big gaping hole. <laughs> hey, you know what? They have antibiotics. So I went with it. <laughs> uh. But then, you know, the minute you get a, a small hemorrhoid, you go, oh, um, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> got to get more fiber in your diet. Yeah, that, that's what it is. So, yeah. <laughs> less, less pizza, more broccoli. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't push so much. Yeah. Don't strain so hard. Well, it's kind of hard when you go on those drugs because they, they, they shut you right it up. It messes up with oh, you. My yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, now we sound like old people. Um, <laughs> just saying. Dalkal Axe is my friend. Um, anyways, <laughs> so where were we? Oh, yes, Mars. We're talking about Mars and being green on Mars. Okay, yes. so you're saying, why go to Mars if you're going to turn green? And exactly, be, and, be and have all those other issues. Right. So, 
does this mean that set, settling on Mars is a non-starter? They asked this question in the in the article. Not necessarily, mm-hmm. but, but but anyone on Mars would need or at the very least appropriate protection from radiation as well as various medical interventions to address other negative health effects. One thing's for sure, it certainly won't be as easy as Elon Musk seems to think it will be. I can tell you this much. Uh, Captain, uh-huh. Captain Kirk thought green women were sexy. Just saying. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so at least you'll get a little from Shatner. So that's, that's a good thing. So there you go. There you go. Uh, let me see here. I think we have... Oh, we have one more story here before we go to break. A famous okay. British UFO sighting is the inspiration behind a new play, Mally. Okay. There you go. Uh, we'll end it kind of on an upbeat note before break. So there you go. And then we're going to go down again after uh, break. Spoiler alert. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, The incident involved reports of a red saucer-shaped object that baffled Stoke-on-Trent locals back in the 1960s. Now, the strangeness began on September 2nd of 1967 when reports started to emerge of something strange in the skies over Bentley Stoke-on-Trent, which is situated in Staffordshire, England. Descriptions of the phenomena... um, I could play a little thing that goes phenomenon, but you can, you can figure it out. (laughs) Right. Uh, But uh, started to, or seemed to differ slightly, but most witnesses agreed that the object was saucer shaped and exhibited a number of lights, which routinely changed color. Some also described it as having a red glow that did not seem to be giving off any heat. It seemed like a saucer. And then it changed in different colors, said one witness. It changed like red. And then it, come into like a greenish color and then a blue. That was the quote from the actual person who saw it. There was no heat. It was just a red glow, like a sunset, another added. In total, there were around 70 independent sightings of the phenomena. It's a... No, that's just crickets. I was going to play the phenomena (laughs) thing, but it didn't happen. Uh, Now, several decades later, a new play is being produced all about the incident. It's named Bright Lights Over Bentley. That doesn't sound right, I know. It is being (laughs) produced by the local Clay Body Theater and will begin its run this Friday at the Dipping House for anyone who happens to be visiting the area. Uh, The idea is that something might be out there in general, and that is like a kind of world where people on a mass scale saw something in our area. I think that's kind of like really kind of wild and magical, said cast member Jack Wilkinson, who I guess like kind of like struggles Mm -hmm. to like say things so there you go so that's that story gotcha yeah brand new play about bentley so there you be all right when we come back evil things are afoot when it comes to ai in london we'll tell you why ai wants to revive a dead art critic yeah yeah right we're gonna get we're gonna get morbid with it when we come back from break. Um, also, we'll tell you a little bit, just a tiny bit, about a Bucks County hotel named one of the most haunted in America. That's coming. Ooh, up. I like that. Yeah, that's coming up after the break. Scientists solve the mystery of a strange sound or sounds in the Mariana Trench. We will talk about that after the break, and we will end things today. On a delicious note. Ooh. Yeah. We'll be talking cheesecake today. Love cheesecake. Yeah. We'll be talking about that at the end of the show today. So we'll we'll end things on an up note today, Mel. How do you like it? Very cool. I like that. That's what we'll do. And we have a pair share story for you today. I promise. I swear. I'll remember it this time. (laughs) So that's all coming up next, right here on a Supernatural News Wednesday with Parashare, right here on the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio on a Wednesday. It's Supernatural News and Parashare. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Right over there is Mally Fox. 
I know we haven't had the best week, Mally. <laughs> no. But there's been some good things out there. Like I said, <laughs> Tyler and Maya got married this weekend. It was a beautiful weekend. It was a little hot, a yeah. little warm. Uh-huh. Uh huh. My chippers did think I abandoned them for the weekend. I I did uh-huh. have to. I did have to. Uh, I did have to rebond with them. I got to show everybody out there a little picture real quick before we get moving with news. I sent it to I sent it to your phone, but I'm gonna uh-huh. I'm gonna show the entire audience. Very on cute video. picture. Oh my gosh, I was out uh, <clears throat> I was out on the uh, on the porch the other day, and it was just it was just me and it was just me and uh, my buddy. It was me and uh, me and Indy, and Indy showed me a little trick. See, I have this little uh, on the porch. I have this little clamped on uh, bird feeder. It's just like a little open mesh dish, right? And on this little open mesh dish, I put the same black oil sunflower seeds that I give the mm-hmm. give the chippers, right? Because mm-hmm. you know finches and other birds like the black oil sunflower seeds, right? Yeah. So I've seen Spud up there once. Spud will climb up there, but Spuddy she climbs up she climbs up the rail or up the rail of the porch and does it by getting in the flower pot and then getting up to the rail of the porch and then she gets in and then she. She eats out of the the bird feeder, mm-hmm. and I thought, well, that's kind of clever. Way to go, Spuddy! If you can do that, I mean, there's only five other dishes with sunflower seeds in them. Why would she need to eat out of there? But she just does it because she can, right? Mm-hmm. So the other day, I'm sitting in my chair on the porch, and I'm throwing peanuts to to Indy, and Indy kind of looks at me and says, not says, because obviously chipmunks <laughs> don't talk. Right. If you have a talking chipmunk, right, you better we, be making some money. Then I have a trillion dollars, right? <laughs> right. But Indy kind of looks at me and gives me that look like, hey, you want to see a magic trick pop? I'm like, sure. And jumps up into the chair next to me, then jumps up on the on the uh, arm of the chair, then jumps up onto the porch uh railing and then runs across the railing runs on onto, onto the other railing where the bird dish is mm-hmm. jumps into right there into the bird dish and I love those cheeks and <laughs> proceeds to fill up his cheeks with uh, sunflower seeds and there he is mm-hmm. and he gives me the uh, the look and he keeps putting his his snout down into the uh, the seeds and filling up his little cheeks with uh, sunflower seeds and then looking up and then filling it and opening it, you know, and then looking up and filling and looking up like, I know you're taking pictures of me. Right. And then he's giving me the look like, what? What? I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> but I just thought that was the cutest little picture right there. Mm-hmm. Of him. So if you're listening to the audio podcast, you can go to darknessradioshow.com, look at the video podcast of this and you can see the picture of... Indy giving me the guilty little look of just, yeah, I just thought it was just the cutest little thing. <laughs> I, uh, uh, it's just the cutest little look. So I posted it in the chat room as well. They thought it was a cute little picture of Indy. Mm-hmm. So that just makes me happy, that little look. Oh, God. <laughs> See, I can't, I can't be happy for too long. AI catches up. <sighs> Son of a biscuit, AI. Yeah. And boy, they're getting morbid, Mally. Ugh. First story today is a London newspaper plans to revive a dead art critic with AI. And they laid off their real writers. <laughs> I think that's the fear of most writers these days, is that AI is mm-hmm. going to take their jobs. Yep. I mean, they even went on strike in Hollywood last year over it. Yeah. How long were they on strike for? It was a while, wasn't it? It was a good, what, three, four months long? Yeah. Yeah. One of London's biggest newspapers is resurrecting a famous editorial personality via algorithm. Brian Sewell, who died in 2015 at the age of 84, was once described as Britain's most famous and controversial art critic. He wasn't afraid to piss people off. This is a quote and was frequently referred to by a long list of adjectives that weren't always flattering. (laughs) Am I got a man? That's right. Use that colorful language. (laughs) For years, he wrote for the London's Evening Standard, publishing his incisive and cutting commentary for a weekly column. Now in a development that, were he alive, it seems safe to assume he would completely and utterly hate 
The newspaper has resurrected his byline and will resume publishing articles in his name. Unfortunately, instead of having a real human write the articles, they will be penned by an artificial intelligence program. The news comes via a report from Deadline, which quotes two sources with knowledge of the newspaper's plans. Deadline writes that A.I. Sewell has been assigned to review the National Gallery's new Vincent Van Gogh exhibition titled Van Gogh, Poets and Lovers, and that the plans for the chatbot's deployment were discussed at the highest level of the standard and in consultation with Lord Lebedev, who is the newspaper's proprietor. Why a publication would do this is unknown, and most of the plausible explanations are bad. It doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility that the standard is merely trying to stir up controversy and outrage to drive reader interest. That's probably a bad way to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, The newspaper hasn't been doing very well lately. It recently switched from daily to weekly editions and has been laying off a lot of real human writers. So a publicity stunt of some kind would make some sort of sense. It's possible that standard editors earnestly, albeit inexplicably, think that readers will be interested in what a chat bot named after a dead art critic has to say about art installations. Maybe they think people will find it cute. The writer of this article says, I really have no idea. We also don't know where the standard plans to get its AI version of Sewell, whether it has an in-house team that will build the virtual writer or will partner with an AI firm to get the job done. Gizmodo reached out to the standard to ask them for details and will update the post when they receive a response. But what does the critics heirs say? I mean, do they have any input if it can actually be used or not? You know, that's a very good question. Um, I would tend to think that the heirs, the heirs would, well, you know, his family should have some say as well. I, I would think that there yeah. would be some sort of copyright or. Right. You know how right. like f- family members sue for likeness or, yeah, you know, if someone that's passed, I wonder if they can do that with this guy. Yeah. I would think they would be able to stop it if they wanted to. Yeah. Or maybe he doesn't have any living family members. If he doesn't, then they can they can go ahead and do it. Now, the only yeah. other thing that would trump that would be the parody law. Ah. Mm-hmm. If they said they were doing it in parody of him, they could go ahead and do it. Okay. That That's the only thing that would trump that. No one has used that as a defense yet, which is curious. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised nobody has. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's yet to be seen. Whether a court would stand for that or if they'd throw it out remains to be seen. Right. Um, because a lot of AI is, has such a likeness to yeah. others that they they have yet to say, I don't see where the parody or the comedy is in this. Uh-huh. That makes it parody. Yeah. Um, but no one has ever made an AI likeness of someone and said, oh, no, 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 this is meant in jest. It's It's parody. Yeah. But I'd like to see someone try and defend it that way. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting. All right. Next up. 300 previously unseen Nazca uh, geoglyphs are discovered by AI in Peru. AI has done something that we can't do with human eyes. Okay. Scientists have used artificial intelligence to find new geoglyphs that had been lost to time. Situated on a remote, arid plateau in southern Peru, the Nazca Lines are a series of spectacular artistic designs, including images of spiders, monkeys, hummingbirds, fish, and lizards that were skillfully etched into the desert floor approximately 2,000 years ago. Most of the more prominent designs were produced by removing the red-colored pebbles that litter the desert to unveil the white, dusty ground underneath. Some of the drawings are huge and measure up to 200 meters across. The precise number of such geoglyphs present in the region has long remained difficult to determine, mostly due to how worn and indistinct many of them have become over the years. More recently, however, artificial intelligence has enabled scientists to pick out even the most faint examples, bringing these long lost pictographs to light after being hidden for centuries. Now following a research effort spanning just six months, scientists using AI have unveiled a whopping 303 previously unseen geoglyphs, 
essentially doubling the totally or the unknown I'm sorry, essentially doubling the known total number. The new designs include both human-like figures and animals such as birds and fish. One of the weirdest has been described as a killer whale holding a knife. Which I think is wishful thinking on AI's part. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think maybe AI is getting pareidolia? I think so. <laughs> a killer whale holding a knife. Yeah. Exactly how many more geoglyphs remain undiscovered in the region, however, remains to be seen. Well, if AI's got pareidolia, <laughs> could, right. could be seeing a lot of things with a knife. That's, that's all I know. <laughs> <sighs> Great. They've discovered a killer AI that wants to show us things in the desert. Mm -hmm. Becomes that episode of The Walking Dead. Go look at the flowers. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then also if those drawings were 2,000 years old in the desert, how would they know what a killer whale looked like? In the desert, nonetheless. Yeah. How many oceans are there in the desert that they're drawing killer whales out in the, in the, in the sand? Right. Unless there was something there and it's just over 2,000 years it evaporated. Who knows? You bring up a very good point, Mally. I think AI is a liar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't trust it. I don't trust it for anything. I don't either. AI is the devil. Yeah. Like yeah. when people are starting to have their houses with AI and stuff. Hell no. Well, I do have an, I, I do have an, an A-L-E-X-A -A right next to me. I do not because I already have ads showing up on my phone for things I discuss. Yep. So, and some of my, some of my discussions are not for... <laughs> young <laughs> audience <laughs> where I'm surprised FBI or people have not showed up at my door going, ma'am, you, you need to be locked up. You know, so I definitely do not have the A L E X A in my house. You know, the only reason I got it initially, right. is because it had the Samuel L. Jackson voice on it. Oh, and because, yep. because I wanted to try some of the trick questions about whether it reports back to the FBI or not. Okay. Just to watch it shut down. Uh-huh. After that, it was a one-trick pony. I mean, <laughs> I got the one with the screen so I could, like, watch videos every once in a while. Yeah. But I got to admit, I'm kind of A-L-E-X-A -E dumb. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't really want the recipes on it. Yeah. Every once in a while, there's kind of something fun on the tech spotlight. But, uh, yeah, you know, we got a free one with our phone or yeah, was it our ring camera? It was something. We got a free one. We never took it out of the box. And then we ended up giving it to Derek's mom because she was talking about getting one. We're like, hey, we've got one. Never been opened. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your ring camera. There's I mean, it's it, <clears throat> this one will integrate with the ring camera, but we haven't set the ring camera up yet. Uh huh. Mainly because we know the Blue Jays would pick it off and then take it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's one. Our of those... camera goes off because of the squirrels on our porch. They're like hanging out. See, I <laughs> I need one to track Arnold. Mm hmm. Arnold will eat anything now on the porch. I think he'll, he's starting to eat the porch. Yeah. Maybe I need to set up the ring camera. I need to do yeah. that. I think I'll do that. Our, this ours keeps showing the squirrels burying stuff in my flower beds on the porch. Oh, speaking like of, my flower pots and stuff. Yeah. Like son of a biscuit. Get out of there. We, we allowed the chippers to start gardening. Okay. And they, they actually, they, they buried a few of the, the sunflower seeds in the, into the flower pots. And now we have uh -huh. these beautiful sunflowers that have grown. Okay. Yeah. They're quite beautiful. I, I should take pictures and then I'll send them to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have, we have some beautiful little sunflowers that have grown in the sunflower pots. It's mainly Spuddy that's growing. Up. Right. Yeah. She's got the green thumb. Uh, yeah. But, you know, but she hasn't, she's not taking credit. <laughs> she, she really should, but she hasn't. <clears throat> but I know that can be irritating to, for some, for, for us. We're, we're quite proud. Right. Yeah. So I know we're weird. Anyhow. <laughs> oh, we got off track. We were talking about AI. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a physicist suggests that the Bible holds proof that we live in a simulation. That would mean Alex, okay. A L E X A is our master. Yeah. Uh. I don't like to think about that either. 
No. Uh, Professor Melvin Vopson maintains that God could, in fact, be an artificial intelligence governing our artificial reality. How's that sleep looking for you, Mel? (laughs) Well, for everything's a simulation, I would like it to change a little bit, please. (laughs) Yeah, this week has been a real shitty simulation. Let's mix it up, shall we? (laughs) Let's do a reset. The article starts out, what if we told you that the world you live in isn't real? It might sound like a concept straight out of the Keanu Reeves science fiction movie, The Matrix. But according to some of the world's top minds, the idea that we are living inside a computer simulation is not only possible, but perhaps even more likely than the idea that we are living in the real world. Hmm. That's how it ends. Um, Oh, That's an odd way to end the sentence. But if that was true, how would we go about proving it? According to physicist Melvin Vopso, an associate professor in physics at the University of Portsmouth, the key to proving that we live in a simulation could lie in the pages of the Bible. For example, the Gospel of John states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Vopso maintains that the word is, in fact, the underlying code that governs the simulation. The code running the simulation is not separate from the divine, but rather an integral part of it, perhaps an AI, he explained to Mail Online. I think this guy spent too much time in coding class. Yeah. That's what I think. It implies a creator who brought the simulated universe to existence through the word, i.e. the code, It suggests the act of creation, as described in the Bible, could be uh, an analogous to a divine act of programming and simulation. I really think he's thinking too hard about this. Mm -hmm. What is truly remarkable is that the interpretation given is fully aligned to the events of our time. The emergence of the AI, and so it is exactly what the Matrix was projecting. As things stand, however, there is no way to confirm one way or another that we are actually living in a computer simulation, let alone the pages of the Bible are trying to tell us something about it. Instead of viewing the simulated universe hypothesis as antagonistic to religious beliefs, one can see it as offering a complementary perspective, said Vopso. So are you trying to tell us that Jesus is Neo? (sighs) Is that what that is then? Because otherwise, that doesn't that doesn't compute. I think he's just trying to stir the pot. I think so too. Yeah. Okay. One more. One more, and then okay. I swear we're done with this. All thing. right. I can tolerate one more. All right. <laughs> this one may actually make you laugh a little bit. Okay. We need a good laugh. A Playboy mom is forced to move home due to trolls and fears that AI may be fatal to the adult industry. That's right. AI okay. killed the Playboy bunny, Allie. Uh, mm-hmm. A Playboy mom was or has named one thing that could be fatal to the adult industry. 33-year-old... Oh, she's old for, for the adult industry. 33 is old for the adult industry? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. She's practically middle-aged. She's Louise. 33-year-old Sarah Blake Cheek. Recently moved her family to Las Vegas after miserable trolls made their life difficult in Florida. I thought life was difficult in Florida, as it is. Yeah. But the salon owner turned Playboy model is now living in a million dollar house inside a gated community overlooking the famous strip. Okay, so it can't be that bad. No, no, no. Life is pretty easy (laughs) for her. She said her new neighbors were much more liberal and accepting of her other saucy job, but she now has named the one thing she fears may be fatal to the adult industry. And that is the mom of four who joined OnlyFans in November of 2020, there's a shock, believes the use of artificial intelligence is deceptive and dangerous. She said some models use bots to chat to subscribers who are none the wiser, but they're actually speaking to a robot. And speaking to the Daily Star about the consequences, she said, this is fatal to the industry. It is scamming subscribers and taking advantage of models. My industry exists because people are lonely. They've entered into a marriage where they where they provide and are seen as an ATM. 
So they look for human interaction where they can have their needs met. And not by a bot. <laughs> I think that was brought up before, wasn't it? Where there were sites that weren't using real people. Yeah. Yeah. She says, Talk well, she seems to be doing okay, though, even if there are AI she, fictional people out there. She wants to earn her money, honestly. Mally, that's <laughs> for sure. She says, talking to a bot or chatter, someone a model pays to chat or subscribe or to subscribers kills the reality of what it is for them or what this is for them. Uh, Sarah went on to say that she has built meaningful relationships with the majority of her subscribers who open up to her about a range of things from sport to their personal lives. The blonde bombshell turned to saucy modeling during the pandemic and has become so popular that one fan even tattooed her face to his body. Oh. Here's what it looks like right there. <laughs> 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 oh lordy someone's desperate yeah yeah that's not even like a good tattoo it's not but despite how or despite now having an army of fans she said she still speaks to them without the use of agencies or ai it's not impossible at all if you're up front she told the star when asked if ai would make her life simpler if i'm at my kids football game I tell my fans that it'll be a minute. Constant communication is respected and understood. <laughs> what do her kids think? Come on, you're a mom. Get off of OnlyFans. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Or get the OnlyFans off during the game, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Watch it. Some of the parents are there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can help. I mean, you know, give them a buck or two. But I mean, come on. If the kids' friends find out... <laughs> They're going to get teased. Well, and but, no kid wants people to see their mom like naked. Mama's doing making stuff. Mama's making the bread. Ugh. There's a reason you got you doing got those something. fashionable new clothes here, kid. Mama's making bank. <laughs> and her husband's okay with that? Ugh. Hmm? Her husband's in one of the pictures. I'll show you in a second. Uh, Sarah he probably is in Kerringer. Probably. Probably driving his little fancy car, sports car, because of got her. A, got a brand new boat because of Mama, I'm sure. Jeez Louise. Sarah now provides content for her fans on Realme. R-E-E-L Me. A subscription platform where she claims no outside agencies are allowed to work on the model's behalf. She added there was no chance some guy in the Philippines or a robot was going to pretend to be her there. <laughs> But despite her fear about the growing influence of AI, including models with digital clones, she's confident that real life creators will still be in demand for years to come. This is uh, this is what she doesn't look like when she's tattooed on someone's arm. You can tell that was a really shitty tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. She looks nothing like the tattoo. Uh. -uh. <laughs> You know, whatever. Uh, Good she, for her she, <laughs> for she, making a living, but not when you have kids like that. She I claims, don't I don't think AI will ever replace creators. The reality is way better than the models in general. And uh, guess what? She's in for a rude awakening. I think guys like naked chicks no matter if they're real or not. Can I just close circuit to all the ladies out there? Guys are pigs. They don't care. Yeah. They can't tell the difference anyways. <laughs> we have an HD gene. We can, I mean, we can tell high definition, but uh, we don't care. We don't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she, uh, she goes on to say, uh, the reality is way better than the models in general and people don't desire models. They desire what's real. <laughs> That's why you have fake tits. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's a uh, highly processed in that photo. Yeah. Uh, the successful ones are the stay-at-home moms you see in pickup lines, the grocery store, and at the gym. Uh, yeah, but again, um, <laughs> there's uh, how real do you think this is, Mally? Uh, how much surgery do you think has been done here? Oh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, she's a lot. She's a hundred percent processed, right there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's nothing. She's the there. kind that you take home from the bar, and the next day you're like. Who the hell are you? Where'd the girl go that I woke up next to? She is so much makeup. Right, right. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's nothing. She's like a Kardashian when they have all that makeup on when they're neck when they're like naturally beautiful, and then you put all that stuff on. It's like, ugh. By the way, this Her face is, is going to be left on the pillowcase. This is Matt, and they have four kids together. Nice cut off t shirt. Right. Shirt. Yeah. Doesn't he? Scream? He looks like the kind of like you. Shouldn't you be working right now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> After she got off like an eight hour shift on OnlyFans. Do you think he has a job? By the way. No. 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 He. Doesn't. He does not look like he, he has one. Work. He doesn't work. No. No. He doesn't even run the kids back and forth to school. Yeah. Nope. He uh he sits at home. <clears throat> he uh, he's got a chaw on his lip, and he's uh, drinking White Claw all day long. And he's watching NASCAR. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's what's going on in that household. <laughs> or those bass shows. Yeah, yeah. And he's Going probably uh, when he when he's not chawing and drinking White Claw, he's probably uh, smoking bath salts. That's that's what's going on. No, he looks too healthy to be doing bath salts. Okay. He has no scabs on his face. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably airbrush for the camera. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, she does enough airbrushing on herself. She probably moves it over to her husband as oh, well. Oh, hi oh <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, she's making a living. I just I you know, I'm the last person to get on the soapbox about making a living, but when you have kids, I just I think it's wrong. Anyway. But then Okay, so how, she's 33, so she's probably got what? She's got about five to six years left, uh, maybe seven to make that. And her current, to make that amount of money? Yeah, to, to make probably, that. Probably, probably before the, before the next young girl comes along. Yeah. Young then, woman. Then she's done. Yeah. yeah. Things start sagging a little bit more. Mm hmm. I just, but uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because I was brought up in a very, a different household where you just you don't do that kind of stuff especially when there's children because what are the children going to look up to oh my mom shows her body on you know for paying paying fans she you know what i mean there's no um yeah. Yeah. what's the word i'm looking for pride Not, humility yeah yeah there we go <laughs> self-pride oh. I, I, I mean you got to do what you got to do but when you have kids i don't know i think totally different well she's got four of them so she's, I know. know. And if she's only 33, they're young. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just worry about the kids and they're, they're uh, growing up and how people treat them when they find out what her mom does or their mom does. Obviously, she's not worried about the kids. And what no, she's they're... not because she lives in a million dollar home and has probably fancy cars and boats and you name it and clothing and surgeries, obviously. Oh, plenty of surgeries. But I yeah. mean... I guess I'd rather have her do that than robbing a bank. True. Although her husband probably robs the bank during the day. I'm just saying that. You know, he's got to <laughs> He's do. probably her manager. <laughs> Managing what? <laughs> hey, you all never know. All he's got to do is look at the bank account every day and just say, honey, we made more money. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all that's going on there. There's not, there's not a lot going on there. Not a lot going on there. All right, it's yeah. time for me to stop being petty. Get yeah, I know. Me. We're going to get haters. Yeah. We're going to get a bunch of people who have OnlyFans accounts that are doing well and going, I'm doing better than you are. Listen, I do sometimes get envious, but the amount of money that some of those people make, I'm like, dang. <laughs> what I couldn't do with that amount, but I just I, I just can't do it. So that's why today we're announcing the Mally Fox OnlyFans account. <laughs> 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 Mama's got to pay the bills. <laughs> just, God, they're only getting higher. I just gave a bunch of guys a bunch of heart attacks. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll pay me not to be on OnlyFans. <laughs> there, are, there are a bunch of guys who thumbs. Like, don't, oh, do don't do it. <laughs> they just did ah. the search on OnlyFans to find Mally Fox. <laughs> <laughs> How do I spell Mally? If I did again? OnlyFans, I would be like anonymous. Like I would never show my head. It would just be like. Chin down. <laughs> and Maybe even only feet. Except I do have a broken toe, so it's a little crooked. But <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's Mally's name on OnlyFans, chin down. Yeah, um, chin down. Or crooked toe. <laughs> crooked toe. But um yeah, I just yeah, if I was on it, you would not you would not know. I would not be telling anyone. <laughs> So if you find somebody no named Chin Down on yeah. OnlyFans, you know that's Mally. 
Get uh, some... Chandel, Michigan. That's me. <laughs> Chandel, Michigan is really now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's finally given up the ghost and she's uh, yeah. She's making extra income. Paranormal's not paying the bills, so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so. Maybe I'll have like a little ghosty face on. <laughs> <laughs> a little sheet. <laughs> or the or the ghost face from uh from scream oh, from scream <laughs> yeah but then i'll probably get in trouble for copywriting or something true, <laughs> like i yeah. start paying them money true yeah well hey yeah. if you make enough it won't be any big deal <laughs> that's true that's yeah. true yeah. <laughs> although let them try and find you are they really going to find you by the crooked toe i mean come on <laughs> let them try I'm going to find someone that likes that fetish of a broken toe. <laughs> oh, that's <hot. laughs> But I couldn't talk either because I think I have a very distinctive voice or laugh. So it's like I couldn't. There would be so many things I would have to do to like not. I, 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 got, a vo- I got a voice changer on Adobe Audition. Just send me the audio <laughs> tracks. <laughs> Do you like movies? Yeah. <laughs> Do you like scary movies? Yeah. <laughs> How about broken toes? <laughs> no, okay, this is going to seem weird, but somewhere there's like five guys out there that are really getting off on this conversation right now. And I'm going to get three emails during the week. So when does that site go up again? Yeah. Um, all right, and they'll be like, you know, I looked up Chindown, Michigan all week and there was nothing. <laughs> this is so disappointing. Oh, my parents would disown me. <laughs> <sighs> but, you know, all that money would soothe you. I'm just saying that if they, <laughs> if they did. <laughs> just it would soothe me, but not my parents. No, oh. that's the thing. If they disappeared out of your life, all that money would soothe you. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I'm just trying to make an argument for those three guys out there. Yeah. Speaking of people emailing us, Mally, we have uh, yes. Parashare this week. Um, okay, cool. And we still have uh, we still have a story from a story or two from Craig Rhodes that we need to uh, get. Uh, I almost said burn through. Um, that we need to uh, get out of the way, burn through. Uh, need to talk about. Uh, Craig Rhodes had a series of stories that he sent to us. Uh, the next story, or the, the second to the last story that we need to talk about is actually an interesting one. He had uh, the last, if you remember right, he had a couple of Grim Reaper stories that he had told us about. Mm-hmm. One about him, one about his friends, or his friend, uh, singular, not plural. The next one is called The Heavenly Voices. He said, my first wife and I were having trouble having children. We eventually started IVF treatments, but each time my wife got pregnant, she would miscarry. One day, my wife had uh, reached her breaking point and called me at work in uncontrollable sobs, saying she was done with everything. She was crying uncontrollably, and I was afraid of what she would do. I worked at least one hour away, but I told my boss what was going on, and he said, go. As I was driving home, I started praying for my wife her safety and her well-being. I then started to question whether we would ever have children and why we kept miscarrying babies. And I questioned whether we would have a child. Suddenly I heard a booming voice that seemed to come from everywhere, yet nowhere physical. You would think that I would have been frightened, but I seemed to accept this voice as if nothing were out of the ordinary. The voice told me that she will be with child, children, It was as if in mid-sentence, they changed it from child to children. I asked when. The answer was, but a moment. Mm -hmm. I asked again. I received the same reply, but a moment. No matter how many times I asked, I just kept getting the same response. I then asked, why do we keep miscarrying? The answer, because it was not the time. I then asked, why we even got pregnant if it wasn't time? The answer, because she had given up on even being able to have a child. We had to prove to her that she could. Mm -hmm. When I got home, I told my wife what had happened in the car, and her tears instantly stopped. She said, that's true. I had given up. We took a break from IVF, and when she was ready, we tried again. We were about to head to a spiritual retreat in Ohio, but right before the trip, 
The doctor called with the news. It didn't take. You're not pregnant. My wife was devastated. We went to the retreat anyway. On the last day of the retreat, several women were doing healing, laying of hands on her. When one of the women said, I see two balls of energy in your womb. My wife became angry and told her the doctor had said that we were not pregnant. We got back to Atlanta and the doctor's office called and asked her to call back. She said she wasn't going to call them back, but she did. And they asked her to come back in for another blood draw. She was angry and wanted to know why. They just said, please come in. She did, and the results came back. You're pregnant. Eventually, we would find out that we were going to have twins. Like the lady told her, I see two balls of energy. Our little miracles are now in their late 20s. Oh. That's a nice story. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a happy ending. That is. The next one from Craig is called The Angel. When our twins were born, we were bringing them home from the hospital. Right across the street from the end of our driveway was a neighborhood watch sign. I'm five foot nine, and my head only came to the bottom of the sign. We were both exhausted from the extremely long birthing process. As we were approaching the driveway, I saw an extremely large angel standing guard in front of that tall sign. He made the sign look small because he was so large. I don't know if it was the fatigue or what, but I didn't say a word as I turned into the driveway. Once we pulled into the garage and I turned the car off, I turned to my wife and I said, I just saw something in front of our driveway. She immediately said, you mean that huge angel? I said, yes. We knew from that moment on that our little miracles would be okay. Oh. And those are the two final stories from Craig this week. Very nice. Nice nice stories. Mm -hmm. I do have one story from Mark. Mark. Mark says he sent us a story back in March, and I'm just pulling up that story now. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting is in back in March he had mentioned something about you, Mally. So, I mean, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he said uh, he was holding off his parish here until Bruiser came back. Um, of course. Uh, Bruiser went back uh, went back to wrestling full time, um, but since he said that could be a while, it might be it, it might as well throw one out for Mally, Jessica, Bob, or whoever's on this week. Like I have a rotate, you know, I'm just rotating you right. guys in and out at willy nilly. <laughs> um, by the way, speaking of Mally, don't feel bad, Tim. I was watching Strange Evidence the other day, and she didn't wave at me either. <laughs> I think that was the thing that was meant for you. Um, ah, I, gotcha. I just said occasionally I wave at the TV at you and you don't wave back. Mm-hmm. I think I mentioned that on one of the shows. So. <laughs> Should I start tugging on my ear? Which yeah. means hello. Yeah, do the uh, do the Carol Burnett thing for me if yeah. you would. Yeah, that'd be, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> um, okay, so Parashare. Here we go. This is uh, Mark's Parashare from March. He says it's called the winter of our dis- discontent. He said, back in the winter of 93, um, I was just a teenage kid. One night, we went up to a friend's cabin on Pelican Lake near Breezy Point, Minnesota. This area, I later found out, had been a vacation spot for Al Capone. I even heard rumors that there might be some of his relics at the bottom of the lake. On this night, some friends and I were hanging out lakeside, and I started hearing some loud banging noises coming from the ice. Later, I was made aware that these noises could be from the ice shifting, but at the time, it was a mystery to me. This led to me, along with Derek, another guy who was there, coming back to the area several times a week throughout the winter to investigate. Most nights, we would drive around and see nothing, but some nights, some pretty weird stuff happened. Not to mention, the northern lights were crazy bright that year. We even saw a very large wolf run in front of the car while we were parked off one of the bays. One night while standing out at the south boat launch, I saw something in the sky. It wasn't very high, maybe 100 feet above the trees. It reminded me of a firework streaking through the sky, leaving a very long tail, but moving slowly and in a downward trajectory. When I first saw it, it was a reddish color, but as it moved, it changed color along the spectrum until it was dark purple, and then it just vanished. Interestingly enough, the term specter comes from something passing into visible spectrum of light. 
It made me wonder if I was passing something from infrared through the visible light spectrum and finally to ultraviolet. Another night in the same location, we were sitting in the car looking out across the lake. I saw headlights behind us, so I turned around to make sure it wasn't a cop. The car turned off, but I noticed the light in the sky coming up from behind us. It appeared to be a normal plane with one main light in the front and two lights on either side, presumably on the wings. The only strange thing was there was no flashing lights that planes are required to have. It passed over us and out over the lake. My headlights were off, but I thought since we were facing in that direction, why not try flashing my lights at it? The moment I did, the plane did something completely unexpected. It spun upside down in midair. Then the two wing lights vanished, and a second later, it was gone. That's unusual. Yeah. The last story also happened at the boat landing. On this night, we had grabbed my dad's video camera. It was a big, chunky thing that you had to load a VHS tape into. You remember those days. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, all too well. (laughs) When we pulled up to the shore, we noticed something only about 50 feet or so out from the landing. We walked out onto the ice to investigate. There in the ice was a perfectly round hole at least 12 feet across. Not a tiny fishing hole and not far enough out to be one anyway. That hole hadn't been there the previous night. The next night we came back out and the hole was frozen over. You could still see the impression and it was filled with slush. A few feet into it, something metallic caught my eye. I I pri- pri- I probably foolishly got down and reached out across the thin ice to scoop it up. It was a small piece of goldish metal in the form of a snake in an infinity symbol. That's bizarre. Mm -hmm. Now, it was very windy this night, so windy that you could barely hear. I turned my head away from the wind and suddenly heard the very distinct sound of footsteps nearby on the ice. There was nobody out there but us, and we weren't moving. I discovered that if I cut my ears, I could hear a lot better. I told Derek to do the same. Even on the videotape, when I had turned the mic away from the wind, you could hear footsteps getting closer and closer. Then when the footsteps were right on top of us, the tape has a distortion in it, appearing warped for a few seconds. I cut my ears again. Now the footsteps were running. I told Derek, and next, he was the one who was running, straight back to shore. He had had enough. I followed him back. Not wanting to give up, I gave him the camera and said I was going back out. I definitely heard footsteps and didn't want to leave without pursuing them. The footsteps were now farther away and getting more distant in the direction of the hole. I slowly walked out with my hands out in front of me and open. Don't be afraid, I said, like we were scaring the unseen thing away. Further out I went, with Derek shouting at me to come back. Apparently, he was hearing things around him, too. On the tape, you hear him say, what was that? And turn to the right. At that very moment, something slammed into my sternum, knocking the wind out of me and knocking me to the ground. That was enough for me now, too. I pulled myself up to my feet, coughing and sliding across the ice as I ran back. I threw him the keys and said, just drive. Later, he said he knew I was serious because I asked him to drive even though his eyesight was so bad that he could never get a license. Oh, (laughs) jeez. I was coughing so hard as we left that I had to puke out the door as we were flying down the road. Oh, man, Mark. The next day, I had a large red mark across my chest from the impact. I even called in sick to work the next day, trying to give that excuse to an employer, or try to give that excuse to an employer. Uh, for a while, I was known as the dude that got punched by a ghost. Ha, ha, ha. Until next time, Marky Mark. It's a good story, Mark. Mm-hmm. Now I don't want to go to Pelican Lake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love Breezy Point, but I... No, I yeah, don't. Breezy Point's nice. Yeah. No, I don't want it. A, lot, a good resort area, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to go up there anymore. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> All right, we got a few stories left here on today's Supernatural News. Actually, we've got a, quite a few stories left here, so we got to jump back into it. Let's see here. Our next story is a little bit of a scary story. we got a, uh, a story about a haunted area in Bucks County. 
We go to New okay. Hope, Pennsylvania, where we're talking about New Hope's own Logan Inn, which has made another haunted mansion list. This one put out by the Airport Parking Reservations team at Philadelphia International Airport. And they know scary. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, they rank the top 13 haunted hotels in America on its travel blog site. They quote, as spooky season draws near, thrill, thrill seekers and paranormal enthusiasts alike are gearing up for a spine-tingling Halloween experience. What better way to immerse yourself in the supernatural than by staying at one of the most haunted hotels in the U.S.? They bl- uh, bill themselves as a destination for all things tr- travel. Uh, the Logan, with its haunted spirits roaming the hallways, comes in at number 12 on the list of scary accommodations, uh, guaranteed to leave you on the edge this Halloween. Whether it's a mischievous spirit, a wandering apparition, or chilling unexplained events, each of these locations has a story worth exploring, says the blog site. For those daring enough, a haunted hotel stay may be just the addition your Halloween adventure needs. So what did the team unearth at the Logan? Well, built in 1722 as a tavern, the Logan Inn now plays host to numerous spirits, including the mother of the former owner, Emily, who plays tricks on guests by rearranging their luggage and playing with the room's heater. Boo, kids. (laughs) (laughs) All I can think of is that that character. Boo, kids, playing with the heater. Boo. (laughs) Uh, The general manager says Emily is what they call the spirit that roams the halls. When she was living, she used to live in the inn. The things that still remain that belong to Emily is the bed that people sleep in and the portrait on the wall. She passed away in this bed. Another ghostly resident is a little girl who often is seen wandering the halls, says the blog site. If you're seeking a haunted hotel with a rich history and a touch of the supernatural, Logan Inn is a perfect destination, says the airport reservation team. Other haunted places making the list include the Hotel Provincial in New Orleans, which was once a Confederate hospital. The ghosts of soldiers and doctors are said to roam the halls with guests reporting sightings of bloody apparitions. I stayed there the last time I was in New Orleans. Did you at the hotel? Very cool hotel. Yeah, Mm -hmm. a Hotel Provincial. Uh, Number Mm -hmm. two on the list, of course, is the Stanley Hotel. We've both been there. Lovely. Mm Yep. Number three is the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, which uh, we've talked about on the show before. Mm -hmm. Number four is the Hotel Chelsea in New York, which is haunted by artists, Titanic survivors, and, of course, Sid Vicious and Nancy Spungen. There's a cool documentary on that hotel. Yeah. I think it's on Amazon or something. It's notoriously haunted, the Hotel Mm -hmm. Chelsea. Number five is the Carolina Inn in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is known for its playful spirits, including a ghost who locks guests out of their rooms and another who checks for unlocked doors. Hmm. Interesting. Number six is one that we're both familiar with as well, the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California. Uh, Number seven, the Heathman Hotel in Portland, Oregon, Rooms ending in 03 are notorious for paranormal activity at the Heathman Hotel, including strange noises, moving objects, and ghost sightings. Number number eight is the Sagamore Hotel in Bolton Landing, New York, which is a popular spot for golfers living and dead. Guests have encountered (laughs) a mischievous ghost boy and a mysterious lady, lady in white. Okay, Speaking as one who golfs, Mally, I, I can't yeah. imagine teeing it up and seeing a dead golfer next to me. That would be. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and then asking, do you need to play through? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> this one, I don't know if I've ever heard of before. Let me throw this one at you. The, sure. Ram- the Ramada Plaza Hotel in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I've been to Fond du Lac, but I don't remember a hotel. Yeah. Supposedly, the spirit of for, former owner Walter Schroeder uh, is said to haunt the hotel, accompanied by ghostly screams and unexplained movements. Ooh, ghostly screams sound a little bit freaky. Yeah. Well, as long as the unexplained movements aren't bowel, we'll, uh, we'll take that. <laughs> Uh, the number 10 spot is filled by the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, to be expected, supposedly mm-hmm. haunted by Marilyn Monroe. 
Number 11 is the Hotel Del Coronado in Coronado, California, with uh, Love Struck Ghost Kate Morgan. Number 12 is the Logan Inn in New Hope, Pennsylvania, which was built in 1722. The historic inn is home to several spirits, including Emily, the former, um, well, we talked about the Logan Inn. We just Mm -hmm. did the entire thing there. Number 13, the Hotel La Fonda in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where spirits roam the historic Santa Fe Hotel with guests reporting ghostly sightings and eerie sensations in rooms and halls. I need to start going on some road trips and visit these hotels. Right. <clears throat> but an interesting list, to, mm-hmm. say, to say the least. Kind of all over the place. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. But, I like it. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. All right, we'll move on here as we have a couple of C stories. The first one being, uh, well, I shouldn't say C, one's in a lock. We're going to Loch Ness in Scotland, <laughs> where a mystery creature was filmed moving across the surface of Loch Ness this last week. Now, we had two sightings the week before. Mm-hmm. This right. is another one. It's been busy in Loch Ness this, this past Yeah, because we thought one was gonna was like a huge fish. Yeah, yeah, like an eel or a fish. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. A veteran Nessie hunter has recorded webcam footage showing something unusual moving across the water. I'll give you five guesses who this guy is. The first name is Ian. Ian O'Fadigan, who pops up in every story. He's, he's the oh, one does he? Yeah, he's the one who's manning the webcam over there. Oh, see, I'm so bad with names. Yeah, he's certainly no stranger to recording and uploading footage of Loch Ness monster sightings, having ended up in the local papers on multiple occasions, thanks to his vigilant watch over the surface of Scotland's most enigmatic lock. Uh, the latest footage, which captured was captured on the evening of September 17th at Lock End, uh, shows what appears to be an animal of some sort producing a sizable wake as it moves through the water. Unknown eight-foot-long animal with hump rising out of the water three feet back from the front of the wake And as it turns to the left, reddish-brown hump can clearly be seen out of the water at 1 minute 25 seconds on the screen recording, O'Fadigan wrote. The footage is quite clear, making it easy to pick out the wake being produced by the creature. Interestingly, some people can be seen on the shoreline nearby, but O'Fadigan reckons that it would have been very difficult for them to have seen anything from that position. You can really see nothing at that level across the surface of the lock. You think you would see everything, but you don't. When you're looking across a flat surface, you wouldn't see a wake out in the lock. You have to be at an elevated position, O'Fadigan went on to say. As things stand, the identity of the creature producing the wake remains a complete mystery. Now, there's an update to this story. It says shortly after posting the story, the video itself was taken down by O'Fadigan, he believes that he has solved the mystery. And here's the, the solve to okay. the mystery. In an email to unexplainedmysteries.com, he explained yesterday evening while watching the live stream on the VILN lock in webcam, Loch Ness in clear surface conditions. I saw the same object going the same direction in the same wake. I reported to the mainstream media last week. The object is clearly a swimmer dragging a pale orange float behind him for this reason. <laughs> I have taken down the sighting recording from my YouTube channel. (laughs) Oh, Ian Uh, O'Fadigan. Yeah. Well, at least he was honest and he took it off rather than, you know, swearing up and down still that it was, you know, maybe Nessie. Yeah. That strange orange wake. (laughs) (laughs) That's the one problem I have with one guy who's in charge of all the recording at a particular site. Mm-hmm. Anytime they see something, they go, got him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They get a little overzealous. But mm-hmm. Yeah. But at least he admitted it. Yeah. 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 At least he didn't say, I have indisputable evidence. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> just, just a swimmer. Meanwhile, there is an incredible alien like deep sea creature filmed in the Tonga Trench. This captivating footage captures a deep sea expedition and it shows a very unusual looking creature. The clip, which comes courtesy of the Mindaru UWA Deep Sea Research Center, was filmed during a recent expedition to the depths of the Tonga Trench in the South Pacific uh, Ocean. 
At first, there doesn't seem to be anything there, but then a strange shape begins to emerge from the gloom. A cephalopod with 13-foot tentacles, which act almost like legs as it moves through the water. The species, the big fin squid, is the deepest dwelling of its kind known to science, and this particular example was filmed approximately 3,300 feet beneath the surface of the sea. This is certainly something otherworldly about the way it emerges from the gloom and glides across the seabed, almost like a ghost or something out of War of the Worlds. We always hope to see this type of animal, Professor Alan Jamison told Live Science. Big fin squid are not something you would actively go looking for. They are a species that relies on us coming across them by accident. Tell you what, there's footage to watch of this, and it really is quite eerie. So what I'll do is I'll post the link in the description of this program so you can watch the footage yourself. It's really pretty cool. So, Pretty cool. Big fin squid. Yeah. All right, second to the last story today in Supernatural News. Scientists have recreated the face of a 3,500-year-old Egyptian pharaoh who founded the Valley of the Kings. Uh, graphics experts have recreated the face of the pharaoh who founded the Valley of the Kings and re rewrote history in ancient Egypt. Amenhotep I, the second ruler of Egypt's 18th dynasty, is thought to have died 3,500 years ago at around age 35 before being painstakingly preserved through mummification. He was the first to be buried in the Valley of the Kings, the resting site of almost all the pharaohs of the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties. He was worshipped as a god after he died, primarily because he ushered Egypt into a new age of peace and prosperity during his reign. Want to see a picture of Amenhotep? Sure. Here's what he looks like now. Take a look at oh, that. He, yeah, he looks like... Um, Yule Brenner? <laughs> kind of, but then... Uh, I can't think of the actor's name. Batista? It'll come to me later. <laughs> what? Dave Batista? Yes! I think that's who it is yep. that I'm thinking. I think he does. I think he looks like Dave. Yeah, that's who it is. That's who it is. Yeah, that's I, what I'm thinking. That's what I thought, too. I looked at him and I went, he either looks like uh, Yul Brynner or Dave Batista, one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, Dave Batista could play a, a, a Menotep in a movie. <laughs> Uh, Cicero Moreras, I believe it is, a Brazilian 3D designer who specializes in forensic facial reconstruction, created these images by blending faces made through a variety of methods. One method involved distributing soft tissue thickness markers across the pharaoh's skull, guided by computed tomography or CT scan data from living donors. Another was a technique called anatomical deformation, in which a digital recreation of a donor's head was adjusted until the skull matched the pharaohs. This method was made possible thanks to CT scans of a Menotep skull that were taken in 2021. That work was conducted by paleoradiologist Sahar N. Salim with the University of Cairo and Egyptolo or Egyptologist Sahi Hawass who does not endorse the digital recreations and describe them to dailymail.com as scientifically flawed. Well, it's nice to know he's going along with the work. <laughs> Regardless, their work virtually unwrapped Amenhotep's mummified remains using CT scanning and revealed details of his appearance, skeletal structure, and some preserved internal organs, including his heart and brain. The scans did not indicate a cause of death, but estimated the age of his death at roughly 35 years. Now, when I show you him with hair, you're going to say it's not Batista. Okay. There he is with hair. Nope, it's not. No. Now he looks a little bit more like, um, oh gosh, who's the actor? Um, now I have an actor in mind. I can't think of his name. Not Ben Kingsley. Ben Kingsley could play him, but mm -hmm. who's the actor I'm thinking of now? Uh, he him. almost looks like, um, kind of, oh, what's his name? Billy. <sighs> he was like a comedian, Billy. Billy Crystal? Yeah, a little bit. Just huh. a tiny bit. It's the hair, I think. Tiny bit, yeah. yeah. Just a tiny, tiny bit. In his early days. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um... 
not Sleepless in Seattle. What was the one movie that he was in with Meg Ryan? There were a couple of them. He did a couple of them with Meg Ryan. Yeah, but anyway, that's what I'm thinking. Yep. Uh, Their work has also suggested that he suffered a series of post-mortem injuries, probably inflicted by tomb robbers or by the embalmers who rewrapped the mummy later, said Moreras' co-author, archaeologist Michael Habicht of Finders University in Australia. It also showed that Amenhotep uh, stood about five and a half feet tall. It wasn't very tall huh. at all. His, no, not at all. No, his teeth were in good condition and he had curly hair, Habicht added. By crossing the data from all the projections, we generated the final bust and completed the structure with historical costume, Moreras said. Once Moreras had uh, revealed the Pharaoh's face, he noticed that it didn't match the god that had been depicted in statues. Many mummies, such as Amenhotep I, uh, show a, a retronatism or overbite. And this is generally not reflected in a compatible way with the statues. Also, hmm. the statues will never show an overbite. That's interesting. In general terms, the statues of Amenhotep I are compatible with they're in the nose region, but more gracile in the glabellal region uh, and more projected in the chin region. Amenhotep the first reign came in the wake of his father Amos's first Amos's the first expulsion of the Hyksos invaders and successful reunification of Egypt and represented something of a golden age for ancient Egypt. Not only was the new kingdom both prosperous and secure, but Amenhotep I also oversaw a religious building spree and successful military campaigns against both Libya and northern Sudan. Under the peaceful rule of Amenhotep I, the rise of Egypt was initiated and the heyday of the new kingdom began. Hmm. So Amenhotep I, we got to look at him. We got him. When when, uh, Harry met Sally, that's the movie I was thinking of. When Harry met Sally. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. You got it. All right, finally today, Mel, we're going to end things on a delicious note. Okay. There you go. I like that. We're going to top it off with dessert. Cool. Turns out that last weekend in New York, they had the world's largest cheesecake served at the Cream Cheese Festival in New York. Mm, I love cream cheese. So, okay, I got to ask you, with with the Cheesecake Factory and everything, you got to have a favorite Mm -hmm. slice of cheesecake before we tell you how big this piece of cheesecake was or this cheesecake was. What's your favorite type of cheesecake? You know, I I really like all kinds, but with the Cheesecake Factory, I do it simple. I just do the vanilla bean. Really? But I mean, I like different kinds. I like pumpkin cheesecake. I like, you know, cheesecake with cherries. I mean, I like cheesecake, but yeah, I just, with the, with the cheesecake factory, I just do vanilla bean. There used to be, um, oh, what was that restaurant for old people? And they had pie, <laughs> Baker Square. Baker Square. They used yeah. to, do, they, I don't even know if they still exist, but they, they used to have this dessert. I think it was around Thanksgiving time and it was like. Cheesecake, French silk pie, pumpkin pie. Yes, yeah. It was like layered. It was like seven layers of different kinds of, well, maybe not seven. That's a salad, seven layer salad. But (laughs) there was like all these layers of this cheesecake slash pie slash cake thing that I would always get. So good. There is Uh, still Baker Square around here, Mel. They're they're few and far between. They've closed a lot of restaurants, but mm -hmm. they're still around here. Yes. Yeah, oh, that, but they old, yeah they used to have that one with the cheesecake and the <laughs> so it was layered. It was so good. That old people's restaurant. That's, that's well. I'm sorry, but the last time I went there, I was like the youngest person. <laughs> that's what they're trying to escape is that reputation. That's funny. <laughs> and then here I am. Yeah. Let's just remind you, it's a place for old people. I mean, but again, I haven't been there since you know for probably 15, 20 years. Well, they <laughs> they have me, but... they have very chewable food. Yeah. So. So once again, place for old people. <laughs> Chewable food. <laughs> a bland palate. <laughs> and they take your AARP card there. So there you go. Yeah, well, there you go. Mine hasn't been working. But um, yeah, no, I just remember their pie. I loved it. Oh, yeah. They had the best pie there. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. 
Well, uh, mine, by the way, when you go to yes. uh, cheese, to ask Cheesecake you, I'm sorry. Factory, um, the Cinnabon Cheesecake. Oh, or they have a they have a chocolate uh, fudge cheesecake. That's the best. Okay. Yeah. So either or they used to have mm-hmm. a, a chocolate cherry cheesecake that I love, but I don't think mm-hmm. you can still get it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a toss up between those three. Mm-hmm. Now, do you usually eat the cheesecake right after you're done with your meal or do you bring it home and then you just oh, eat it over the next couple of days? I could eat it right after the meal, but I, really, I yeah. can't. I am so stuffed. Yeah. I can I can eat it right after. I gotta bring it home. Most of the Uh, time, I will bring it home, but I I, mm -hmm. I can eat it right after the meal. I've uh, no qualms about it. I I generally try to eat lighter so I can eat my dessert right after. Oh, see, I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, which I probably should. (laughs) Um. So the annual cream cheese festival took place in Lowville, New York, and it hosted a successful Guinness World Record attempt. Featuring a 15,008 pound cheesecake. Wow. How long do you figure it'd take you to wolf that thing down? I don't know, but I would love to take just a big dive into it and just. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Kraft Heinz plant in Lowville uh, set the record for the world's largest cheesecake at the festival in 2013, but it was beaten mm-hmm. by a team from Russia who made a 9,347-pound cheesecake in 2017. And we all know we can't let Russia win. So (laughs) good old U.S. ingenuity came through when uh, Derek Langdon at the uh, Kraft Heinz plant, he's the quality manager, said he and his team decided to smash the previous record at this year's festival. He said, if you're going to beat it, might as well go big, Langdon told uh, WWNY-TV. We decided we're going to smash that record, make it almost twice as big as the last one. If they were going to beat it, they'd have to go really big. It was go big, he said. A Guinness World Records adjudicator was present for the cheesecake's unveiling and confirmed it weighed in at 15,008 pounds, more than enough to reclaim the title. Wow. This was just unbelievable, Cream Cheese Festival Chair Jeremiah Papineau said, uh, or Papineau, rather, to have a record in 2013 and to win the record again this year. It just shows how this community comes together, and we couldn't be more proud. The cheesecake was sliced and served to festival attendees. The leftovers were donated to local food banks, as it should be. Very nice. 15,008 pounds. Mm. Wow. Can you imagine how much milk it took to wash all that down? I was trying to figure how big the refrigerator would be to get that sucker in there. And it figures. Because don't you have to refrigerate it to set it? Yeah. Well, they probably. Well, how do they do that? Well, they probably, it's at the plant there. So it because oh, if you'll like notice. Like in sections? This is sponsored. <laughs> As you can tell by the picture. I'm not going to tell you right, who right. sponsored it. They're not paying for advertising, but. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So they probably have industrial coolers. It looks like right. when, in fact, as a matter of fact, as they're setting it, you can tell they're they're stirring it. Yeah. They're setting it's it. Like a big old vat. Yeah. yeah. They're in. A, it looks like they're in a re- refrigerated room there. Yeah. Yeah. So they probably are used to keeping it. Well, they have to keep the cream cheese cool, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. I'm, that still blows my mind. Fifteen thousand and eight pounds. Now I'm hungry for dessert. <laughs> well, don't let me stop you. We should probably ra- wrap this show up so you can go get I some. I know. I'm going to have right. to go to the stores before they close. That's right. All right. With that in mind, Mal, uh, paranormalgirl.com. We're coming up on Check fall. Check it out. Yeah. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I, think, I know last time you said you were working on some drink recipes. Is that the deal? Yes. Uh, got busy, but this week I plan on doing it. It involves marshmallows. Oh, Really? Yeah, well, I got to use up all these marshmallows that I've bought for, you know, camping and stuff. Yeah. Before they get stale. Yeah. Well, d- did you do the s'more thing on uh, on the ho- on the camping? Uh, yes. Yeah. That's why I have an abundance of marshmallows left over. There you go. Well, all so right. I always overdo it. I buy too many graham crackers, too many, you know, bags of marshmallows because you never want to be without. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. Now I've got leftovers. Yeah. So yeah. So and the, if you guys are in the Wyandotte area, 
Cemetery Walk next week. Ooh. Get your tickets. There's some still available. That sounds like fun. It is. They decorate the house, and it's a big old mansion that's the museum, and so they decorate it Edwardian style, I think, for Halloween, so it's really cool. First floor is fully decorated. You go on a tour of the cemetery. We have two cemeteries in town. Uh, you go to one of them, and then they tell you, like, the history of some of the people, the prominent people that are buried there. Then you go back to, I think, the Mark's house, and then there's a presentation that's given, and then they give you cider and donuts, and then you can go back to the the home, the big mansion, and do a little walk around and stuff. And they've got the gift shop open. So wow. check it out. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, there Yeah, you go. it is. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. By all means, check that out. Do you know where people can get tickets? Um, Check uh, Wind Up Museum. Okay. I think you have to physically be there. They're so old school. You have to physically go to get the tickets. They okay. don't do online. Okay. But it's for uh, Friday, Saturday, October 11th and 12th. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, housekeeping items. Check out the darknessradioshow.com store. There's new stuff there. Um, you know what I saw this past weekend, Mal? Speaking of Halloween what? stuff. Uh-huh. I was trying to ask somebody at the wedding this. On my way, the, the wedding was in Northfield this weekend. Mm hmm At this complex. I want to say it's Castle Rock or something like that. I think okay. it was a complex. So on w one of the farms on the way there, they were they were decked out for Halloween. They had the 12-foot skeleton up. Next to Very the 12-foot cool. skeleton, they had a 12-foot werewolf. Oh, I haven't seen a 12-foot werewolf. Right. That's and I'm new. like, where do you get that? And one mm -hmm. of the people at the wedding said, probably same place you get the 12-foot the skeleton. And I'm like, well, I thought you got the 12-foot skeleton at Lowe's. They're like, nope, right. probably Menards, uh, which is a Minnesota answer. Yeah. Uh, probably Menards. Um, so I don't know. I, now I got to start hmm. looking up twelve foot werewolf. But yeah. then, what was it that Brad or Brad Blair had? Didn't he have some sort of? Pumpkin, I thought it was a pumpkin. Pumpkin reaper, something or another. Yeah. Mm hmm. People are getting original with these uh, these uh, decorations. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, we fully decorate our house. We just have been so busy, we haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah. It's Beetlejuice theme this year. Oh. <gasps> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I got to do something this year. Mm -hmm. I need a 12 they have to even if it's just like lights yeah I need to find a 12 foot chipmunk like a rabid <laughs> zombie chipmunk a uh, rabid chipmunk <laughs> yep a rabid zombie chipmunk 12 foot tall uh, I always freak myself out though in the beginning of decorating because I'll forget that we've got things in our front yard and so you walk by a window you're like whoosh you know who's in my yard <laughs> at five o'clock in the morning <laughs> what happened to spud um yeah so i think that's i got i gotta do something so all the, yeah, that that, ins to. that inspired me this weekend to see that the two of them standing there so i was like yeah i gotta do something this year mm -hmm. gotta, gotta do something. you have to yeah so uh you know what what i may do is i may ask for your submissions from your yards this year and i maybe we'll put it on the on the blog at darknessradioshow.com there you we'll, go we'll do a little halloween blog We'll get your yard decorations and, and your decorated yards, and we'll we'll list them. We'll list your your name if you want, and we won't do your exact address, but your city of residence. Right. Yeah, and we'll 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 have you show off your yard on on darknessradioshow dot com. So if you'd like to feature your yard or feature your Halloween decorations, uh, send me a picture in your city of residence to tim at darknessradio dot com, and we'll we'll feature it on the blog. So there you go. Watch, it's a house that just has a sign that says ditto. Because <laughs> with an arrow pointing to their neighbors, that's like yeah, yeah. Same. fully decorated. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's not a bad idea. I like that. I'll do that this year. Yeah, I'm just playing yeah. my neighbors here. Uh, <laughs> too lazy to decorate ditto. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tomorrow on the big program, Jody mm -hmm. Levon is with us. I good love friend. her. Yeah, good friend Jody Levon is back on the program. Jody has an interesting uh, workshop program, online program that she has developed. Uh, the way that this developed is unusual. Uh, Jody has gone through massive, massive health issues, including uh, cancer and mm -hmm. an infection that nearly killed her. Oh. And she went through four surgeries, Mel, in a short amount of time. And oh. she was nearly taken from us. Mm -hmm. During that time, 
there were four things, and she'll tell us about them tomorrow, that she wanted to finish before she left this world because she knew she was near death. One of those things was this system that will help people develop their intuition. Jody finished that system, and thank God she's still with us, alive and mm-hmm. kicking and doing so well. So we're going to talk with Jody tomorrow about this system and how it can help you develop, not just develop your intuition, but shine with your intuition and help you with all things essential in your life. So that's tomorrow on the big program. I'm looking Aww. forward to it. Yeah, she's always positive. She's always smiling. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very positive show tomorrow. And I think something that you're all going to get something out of tomorrow. So I encourage you to tune into the big program. tomorrow. So it's, it's a good program. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So that's tomorrow on the big show. So that'll do it for today. Uh, again, check out the store, darknessradioshow.com. Check out paranormalgirl.com. Lots of stuff for you to see there. And uh, check out Mally and Strange Evidence on Max. And until mm-hmm. tomorrow with Jody Levon, we'll see you next time right here on The Best in Paranormal Podcasting. You've been listening and watching to Darkness Radio.